So welcome to the first in a brief series of video blogs in which I'm going to attempt to take some of the work that's been done through Chocker Blog, um, where we've looked at the economics of Scotland versus the rest of the UK and compared those numbers and, and try and understand them to help inform the debate around fiscal autonomy, around further devolution or indeed around potential future independence. I'm hoping that the data I present here is actually not controversial. It's information that should be shared by all sides of the debate, whatever your view of the actual answer is. I'm not going to try and argue for or against fiscal autonomy or for or against independence. I'm just trying to present the data. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make six different points. Um, and in this first blog, I'm going to focus on these two. That is explaining that we have a £9 billion onshore deficit gap between Scotland and the rest of the UK and that's driven by Scotland's higher cost to serve. By the end of this video blog, if you don't know what that means, you will do. And the second point I will make is that offshore revenues, that is oil and gas revenues, have sometimes more than filled that gap. I.e. sometimes we don't have a deficit gap and sometimes we do. Sometimes we contribute and sometimes we benefit from being within the UK. If you already know all that, you can skip to the next video blog, which will be about the forecasts used in the white paper for oil and gas, which were optimistic, uh, of course, and we'll look at the outlook for offshore revenue, which we'll explain is bleak, even if oil prices recover. So I'm going to focus on those first two points, and I'm going to go through this at some pace, because you can always pause the video um, if you want to focus in on anything yourself. So the first thing we're going to do is look at the... 15-year historical per capita differences between the UK or the rest of the UK and Scotland. Let's focus on the data source first of all. It's JAIRS, Government Expenditure and Revenue Scotland. If you don't trust these numbers, I suggest you go and have a look at Chocker Blog and a blog post called Stop Getting JAIRS Wrong, where I explain why you really can trust these numbers. But hopefully you'll realise they're created by the Scottish Government and they are classified as national statistics. Pause this here if you want to know what that means, but basically they comply with the code of practice for official statistics. These are good numbers. Okay, So what we're going to look at is per capita comparisons, that is spend or revenue per head, and we're going to compare Scotland with the rest of the UK. Sometimes you'll see these numbers comparing Scotland and the UK, where the UK includes Scotland. I focus on Scotland versus the rest of the UK, where the rest of the UK doesn't include Scotland. I think that's easier to understand. And the only adjustment I've made to these numbers is to apply a deflator, to, to apply a GDP def deflator, so that everything is stated in 2013-14 pounds. So inflation is, is eliminated from the numbers. So that's the other thing which will explain some slightly different numbers you may see elsewhere. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the onshore revenue and the offshore revenue difference between what is generated in Scotland and what is generated in the rest of the UK and combine that to show how much more we raise in tax. We're going to look at how much more we spend and therefore what the net result is in terms of surplus or deficit. And to be clear about what all of these graphs show, it is the difference. So if, for example, in the UK we spend £2,000 per head on something, and in Scotland it's 2200 then what you'd see here is the difference. £200 being how much more per capita we spend on something in Scotland. So let's look at the onshore revenue we raise. So this is before oil and gas. Anything above the axis means we raise more per person. In Scotland and the rest of the UK and anything below the axis means less. Let's focus on one where we raise more sin taxes. We drink, we smoke and we bet more in Scotland uh, and so we raise more in sin taxes in Scotland. But the biggie of course is income and wealth taxes. What most people think about when we talk about taxes, the, the tax on your income uh, but also capital gains tax etc. And we generate less because we are less wealthy on average than the rest of the UK. The trend line is positive, so it looks like we are getting richer, but we're still poorer and therefore we generate less than the rest of the UK in total. And that number is something around £400, £500 a year less. There are lots of other streams which are actually pretty much of a muchness between us and the rest of the UK. VAT is treated properly in JAIRS. Corporation tax is treated based on the Scottish Government's relatively optimistic assumption around where corporation tax would lie. It's got nothing to do with head office location, which you might sometimes hear as a piece of misinformation. 
Uh, council tax, you can see, relatively coming down a bit because of council tax freezes. And gross operating surplus, the line at the top, is Scottish Water. It's a special case because Scottish Water is in Scottish ownership. Largely nets off on the cost side. Let's not get bogged down with it. If we add together all of those uh, sources of onshore revenue, the net result is that Scotland generates very consistently about £250 per person less than the rest of the UK. The fact that that's consistent isn't surprising because we live in the same tax regime. So unless we got dramatically wealthy or dramatically poorer relative to the rest of the UK, you'd expect this line to be pretty consistent. And of course that could change if we were fiscally autonomous. So all, autonomous. So all we're seeing is historically under current tax regimes and with Scotland's economy performing as it does, we generate about £250 less onshore. Let's look at offshore. Offshore, of course, we generate a lot more revenue between £500 and in a really good year. Notice the 089 good year, that, that number will cause spikes in the graphs to come. Scotland generated £2,500 per person more in tax because of Scotland's oil. So if we add those two numbers together, the offshore and onshore revenue, we see how much we, we raise in total. So that's that offshore graph and there's the onshore graph. Add the two together. This black line is a line you'll get used to seeing. This is how much more per capita Scotland raises in tax than the rest of the UK. And this is obviously a favoured soundbite of the SNP to say we raise more in tax per person than the rest of the UK and we have done for 34 years. I'm only showing 15 years here but it's true for 34 years we raise more in tax than the rest of the UK. Now of course to stop there is to miss the fairly important point that we also spend more and let's have a look at the spending. So this spending graph, same idea as the other graphs we've seen, if it's above the axis we're spending more than the rest of the UK and if it's below we're spending less and there's lots of different cost categories on here so let me just focus in on a couple. Um, transportation, this line, we spend more and actually that's stepped up. Not surprising if you think about the population density of Scotland which is about 20% that of the rest of the UK uh, and you think about island communities and how many rural communities we have to serve. So it's not surprising that we're more expensive to serve. The same is true in health, housing and amenities, social protection. Uh, there are other factors behind social protection and here's one where you can pause the video if you want to look at this slightly out of date data but it takes those data sources and basically where we spend more than 8.3 percent we are spending more. So it's actually not hugely different in pensions, which is the big number, but we spend significantly more on disability, living allowance, incapacity benefits, etc. I'll let you pause the video if you want to try and digest all of that. One area that's worth picking out is education and training, where we used to spend a couple of hundred pounds per person more than the rest of the UK and now we don't. And that's an issue of relative prioritisation. It's got nothing to do with cuts in education budgets overall in the UK because this is relative to the rest of the UK. So insofar as the block grant reduces, that's reduced as a result of reduced expenditure in the rest of the UK as well. So if we pass that on in Scotland, the difference would remain the same. The fact that we no longer spend more on education in Scotland means that we are no longer compensating for the fact that Scotland is a higher cost of service country. It means we're delivering a less good education service in Scotland or we've suddenly found a way of being incredibly efficient with our education service delivery and you look at the outcomes I think you'll know which of those two is the answer. It's also worth noting on basically this is policing public order and safety. We used to spend less and we now spend more because we've centralised Police Scotland I think primarily. There is a VAT issue there but let's not get bogged down with that. Again pause this if you want to try and pick out other lines but Add all that together and we spend between, well, £1,200 and £1,700 per person more on public services in Scotland. So let's combine what we raise with what we spend. And again, this is all relative to the rest of the UK. Um, we get to see this graph. So remember that black profile, remember the peak in 2008-9. So that's we generate more revenue than the rest of the UK, the red line we spend more than the rest of the UK. And of course the difference between these two lines tells us whether we are contributing or benefiting from being within the UK. So when the black line is above the red line, we contribute more in tax than we receive in spend. And when the black line is below the red, li red line, we contribute less in tax than we receive in spend. So if we plot the differences between those two lines, what you get is basically our relative deficit per capita. Again, black lines above the red, then we have, we're, we're net contributing 
if it's below, we're net benefiting. So these are numbers that you may be familiar with seeing as a graph. Um, again, if we're above the line, we're contributing. If we're below the line, we're benefiting. Actually, over this period of time, you can see we've certainly been net beneficiaries of the UK. I'm just going to flick between per capita and as a percent of GDP, and I'm doing that for a reason. This is percent of GDP. This is why you will sometimes hear politicians say when defending Scotland's position, well, yes, we're currently net benefiting these lines below, but actually in two of the last four years, we net contributed. That's true as a percent of GDP. It's not quite true on a per capita basis. Um, we focus on per capita because the debt interest is allocated on a per capita basis. The debt is allocated on a per capita basis. So Personally, I find per capita an easy way to think about it. Again, I'll flick between the two, per capita percent GDP. It doesn't really change the overall story very much, but obviously Scotland has a higher GDP, therefore it generally uh, helps um, the, the presentation of Scotland's numbers. Now, this is very important. Scotland's Future, the white paper, was written based when these were the numbers that were available, or at least 11, 12 were the most recent numbers available, and they took a five-year time horizon. This is why you will hear many sound bites and many things which are still ingrained in people's consciousness that were said on the basis of this five-year period that are frankly no longer true uh, around Scotland's position within the UK. So over this five-year period, because of 08-09, remember that peak of oil revenue, Scotland has been, if you add together the above and below the line, Scotland was paying its way. And in the most recent year, when the white paper was written, Scotland was more than paying its way within the UK. So those statements were true at the time. But of course, time has moved on. And in the last couple of years that data has become available for, we've actually been net beneficiaries to a significant degree. And we'll understand why that is if we come back to this black line, red line and the green line of onshore revenue. So if we just look at the long run averages, onshore, we generate about £250 per person less. We spend about £1,500 per person more. And therefore, there's an onshore deficit gap of about £1,700 per person. Gross that up over Scotland's 5.3 million people, that's £9 billion just over. And all that happens is onshore revenue comes in and washes out that deficit gap, sometimes exceeds it and as it's been washing back out that deficit gap is getting exposed again so when you hear the IFS saying 7.6 billion or saying actually longer term it's more like 8 billion maybe even 9 billion the deficit gap this is all that's happening the relative to the rest of the UK our expenditure and tax revenue generation is assumed to stay the same and that's an assumption uh, and we know that oil revenues are in decline and therefore that deficit gap is being exposed. So that is the deficit gap. Now, now, of course, we've only been looking at 15 years worth of data here. And some people will look at this graph and say, well, why aren't you showing the older data? And of course, we can and should. First of all, notice the red line because that just provides the link between these two graphs. So that is our relative higher expenditure, the red line. And I'm now just dealing in absolute billions of pounds. And the grey line here is basically how much oil and gas needs to generate to offset our higher expenditure. And you can see again the 089, the year in which it recently significantly uh, caused us to be generating a, a relative surplus, caused us to be contributing to the rest of the UK. And of course, if you go back to the oil boom in the 80s, absolutely, Scotland massively contributed to the UK. We've been beneficiaries, we were contributing again, good time to hold a referendum, you might think. Um, and then we know, of course, that recently oil revenues have declined. They could bounce up again. We'll talk about that on another uh, video blog. But what you see here is pooling and sharing at work. Basically, because we put that into the big pot, we were able to get it back when oil revenues are lower as they are now. So some people look at this and see this as a democratic outrage that Westminster stole our oil money. Other people look at this and say, what a perfect example of how pooling and sharing works. We've smoothed out the volatility of oil to enable us to maintain a higher level of expenditure than we'd otherwise be able to maintain. Now, of course, you could have put that into an oil fund and you can have a whole series of debates about that. But the point is, we sometimes contribute, we sometimes benefit. 
overall, roughly, we've been about neutral over that period of time. Recent years, we've been about neutral. Right now, we're a significant net beneficiary. And that's not a particularly controversial point to make and it's not talking Scotland down and it's not drawing any conclusions about where Scotland could go. And so we'll just come back to this graph and this is where we'll leave ourselves on the on this blog. We'll just make a, a couple of observations here. First of all, some people hear about this onshore deficit gap and say it's a terrible indictment of how Scotland's economy has suffered under Westminster rule. Now there's a bit of a problem with that interpretation because actually the onshore revenue generation only explains a very small portion of that gap, i.e. that's the extent to which our economy in Scotland is less productive than the rest of the UK on average. And the main reason for the deficit gap is because we spend more. And we spend more for good reasons. We have a higher cost to serve. But to suggest, therefore, that that means it's Westminster's fault that this deficit gap exists is is slightly strange because it's basically saying it's Westminster's fault that we've been allowed to spend this much more on per public services than the rest of the UK. It's just an observation of fact. I'm trying not to make a political point here or a judgment here. It's just an observation of fact. Now, of course, the question we have to ask going forward is were we to be fiscally autonomous, were we to be independent, or indeed even out, were we to remain within the UK, how can this red line move up or down? How can this green line move up and down? And what's going to happen to the black line? And that's what we'll come back to discuss in the next video blog. And I will pause here, but I will pause with one, if you'll forgive me, maybe this is a political point. If you look at this graph and you see this deficit gap and you see how important the difference between onshore and offshore revenue is, I think you can agree that oil is not just a bonus. Simply asserting oil is just a bonus doesn't make it so. Now that's not to say Scotland couldn't be independent, it's not to say we couldn't manage our way out of that deficit gap, but to deny the existence of the deficit gap is to deny the reality as per the Scottish Government's own figures.